Kate Shanahan, I'm so glad to connect with you again, this time across the great continent from Lake Tahoe, Nevada to Florida. How are you doing down there, Dr. Kate? I'm doing good. I'm on a lake too. It's Lake Carlton, teeny little lake. And what's the name of your little town there? Mount Dora. Yeah, Central Florida. So we had a great visit. Oh, geez, that was almost a year ago. Uh, How Not to Get Cancer. So we have that dialed. Everyone can go look on that on YouTube. It was a fabulous discussion. And now we have a great occasion to talk about something else. And for those of us watching on video, hold that thing up. It's very attractive. (laughs) <laughs> Two very attractive things on the video. It's Dr. Kate herself and her new book, The Fat Burn Fix. Uh, the reason I'm one reason I'm so excited to talk about it is going to help us uh, burn fat and and save our lives and all that great stuff. But also because you've been talking about it for quite a long time, as I recall. How how long <laughs> has this project been in the works? It started about eight years ago when I uh, started just collecting more uh, like. But hacks really like biohacks and creating more of a cis- streamlined system for my patients so that I um, like could identify exactly what somebody needed to do because there's this this big field of ideas out there right now right that's what uh, you are like right in the center of it because you have people with different ideas coming and talking about the benefits of keto versus carnivore versus intermittent fasting and all these different things and different types of exercise. So what the, the book does, the Fat Burn Fix, is it puts all that into context for you. That's what it does that um, is kind of unique because the first thing that I have people do before they take any action, before they start in on the plan, is figure out how well they burn their body fat, because that really determines everything about your health. There's actually really nothing more important to your health than the ability to burn your body fat for fuel, because it's energy. If you can't get energy, then you can't do anything and your cells die. That's what, that's why people uh, have, I mean, that's what a stroke is, right? Certain areas of your brain didn't get enough oxygen to produce any energy and they died. That's what a heart attack is. Certain areas of your heart didn't get enough blood to support the cell's needs for energy and the cells died. So energy is like the solution to so many problems and it's really what you need to feel optimal. So it's, it's, it's like takes care of the whole spectrum of health, whether or not you're a super elite athlete or, or maybe a Di- a diabetic who's been on insulin for 20 years, it's the, the, the problems that you have, if you have any, are because you can't burn your body fat optimally. And it turns out that quite a few people are in that category, even highly fit individuals. Totally. And, and this, by the way, I should mention, this has nothing to do with your family history or your genetics or um, you know, like uh, whether you smoke or even how much you exercise, right? The, the ability to burn body fat for fuel is trumps all of that. And so if you don't have the ability to burn body fat for fuel, even if you quit smoking or start exercising, you're not going to get the benefits that you want from doing all that habit change. So we were born with this wonderful genetic attribute to burn body fat, obviously. We were born with the ability to store body fat, burn it off, store it, and do all these great things that uh, come from the ancestral example, the evolutionary health model. And then uh, there are assorted ways that we screw this up. How, How does this happen? Well, the one way that is the most important way that is, you know, the main problem that's causing everyone's issues um, is the fact that our diets have been re-engineered chemically without us really knowing about it or hearing about it or thinking about it because we now don't, we, because we've changed the kinds of fats that we eat. And so this is where we start to get a little bit chemical. But what I'm talking about is, you know, you go, let's put it in the common, the ordinary experience of trying to go grocery shopping. Let's say you want to get um, some yogurt. Well, you will have a hard time 
finding a flavored yogurt that isn't fat free. And okay, well, all right, let's say you want to get some uh, sour cream. Well, you got to make sure that you get the real sour cream now because there's this thing called fat free sour cream. But cream is fat. And so <laughs> it's not oh, sour cream. I never cream. thought about that, huh? <laughs> Yeah, it's not sour cream if it's you know not fat. So it shouldn't say sour cream, but it's confusing to people. And butter, like uh, I went on a shopping trip with a patient of mine and uh, he didn't know that butter was made from cream. He didn't know to look for cream in the ingredients. So he just went to that section where they sell butter and margarine and Smart Balance and all these spreads. And it turns out all of his life, he thought he was having butter, but he wasn't. He was actually getting hydrogenated vegetable oil spread. So... And, and of course, in all the junk food, right? So in junk food, most junk foods like you know Twinkies or candy bars, they don't have olive oil or butter in there. They have some kind of vegetable oil in there, like you know whether it's uh, soy or canola or cottonseed. Um, that's what the bulk of our junk food has. So we've had this restructuring of the kind of fat that's in our food supply that no one is talking about. And, and so we can't even like, some people can't even understand what I'm saying and that or put it in context or, or even accept that it's happened. They're like, well, I've had conversations with people, intelligent people um, who I've said, yeah, we all eat a lot of vegetable oils and actually 80% of our fat calories now come from vegetable oils. And you know, these things didn't exist a hundred years ago. And, and people will come back with, well, I don't sit down and eat big piles of Oreos, right? So. So that's not me. You're not talking to me. And I don't go to fast food restaurants. I don't go to drive throughs So you're not talking to me. I go to high quality sit down restaurants in New York or Los Angeles or Seattle. I don't care. The fact is that the rare restaurant now uses olive oil in things like pizza, right? It's hard, you're hard pressed to find a pizza joint that uses olive oil. Now most of them are going to use what they call a blend of olive oil, which could be 1% olive oil and 99% soy or canola or whatever other vegetable oil, seed oil is another term for these things. So if we have not paid attention, we as a country, including doctors and most of the functional medicine doctors, and a lot of people even in the keto space, although the keto space is one of the most enlightened when it comes to our fats, um, for obvious reasons, they're all about fat, right? Um, but if we haven't come to terms with the fact that this has happened, we are completely blind to how it's affected us. And that's what the fat burn fix totally helps people illuminate is that, you know, if you can be normal weight, but still be metabolically damaged enough to the point where you're now you're setting yourself up for, for cancer or autoimmune diseases because you're not burning your body fat optimally. Whew. Well, there she is, the world, one of the world's leading crusaders against these nasty refined industrial seed oils. I guess you, you told me that's the, the correct term, and we generally refer to it as vegetable oil, but it's really that chemical process of changing these from their original molecular state, because, uh, for example, the, the soybean or the, the corn is hard to get oil out of, uh, we have a great video, you and I, and I think uh, Luke was in the picture too, uh, the dangers of vegetable oils that you can find on YouTube. And that was like a 15 minute hit where if you're not familiar with what Kate's talking about right now, I encourage you to go and understand why these things are, uh, are so nasty. And I want to have you discuss that even further. Um, but the one thing that jumps out to me is so offensive is that there's still a certain um, segment of the, um, the scene here such as the fine restaurant that you mentioned that doesn't have that cost cutting concern that the, the fast food joint does to use the cheapest oil. Uh, but then you go to Whole Foods Market, the national chain of the highest standards and their mission statement on their website is wonderful. And I go look at the, the hot food buffet and canola oils and everything. And then you go on to the um, aisle 17 and it's got organic uh, soybean oil, organic canola oil or something like that. So it seems as though there's still some acceptance of these toxic industrial seed oils. Can you explain why those are still being sold when the, the evidence is so clear? Well, it's cheaper. That's the number one reason. It's cheaper. <laughs> it's like a, a half, less than half the price, right? And if you go to any store, Walmart, Costco, 
or even Whole Foods. You can compare the prices and the volume of like soy oil that you can buy for less than $20 and how much olive oil can you buy for the same price? Oh my goodness. My friend who's a very health conscious eater uh, was, you know, trying his first jar of Primal Kitchen mayonnaise, which is famously made with avocado oil and it kicked off the whole industry segment. And he complained that it was uh, 10 bucks for a jar of mayonnaise. And it was a great opportunity to discuss that that's not really expensive. That's a fair price for what you're getting in that small jar. But our orientation is the giant jar of best foods with the nasty oil in there uh, for $7 for a gallon. So that's our association where really the, the quality foods are, they're charging a fair price for an $8 bottle. I mean, a, a, an $8 uh, contain, uh, box of uh, dark chocolate that's made from you know, bean to bar with fair trade and all that. But we're so used to paying a couple bucks that we, we have to recalibrate our uh, you know, our, our consumer habits here. Totally. And by the way, uh, a little plug for my YouTube channel, the, the Dr. Kate and Chef Macy show. Um, I'm working with a chef and she has a 45 second video on how to make mayonnaise. So with uh, like $4 worth of olive oil and um, a couple eggs, you can get uh, what, what did she say? It was a, a pint or a quart. Ugh. It says on the thing. <laughs> um, you know, uh, a cup of a cup of olive oil will probably cost you like two or three dollars. You can make a cup of mayo for that much money, basically. And if you have an immersion blender and a few, a minute or two, and then you can customize it to whatever flavor you want. So, um, I mean, that that if if it is expense too expensive, um, then and you want but you love your tuna salad and your deviled eggs and your um, your sandwiches with some mayo, then make it yourself and it's if you have the key is you got to have an immersion blender and you got to have the right balance of emulsifiers and acid but then poof once you get that you're good go watch the dr kate and chef macy show <laughs> on youtube there you can record me for the jingle if you want we'll, we'll try it again <laughs> after we're done here but more importantly um if you uh if we brought on as our next guest the the, the leader of, of whole foods market who's putting this stuff into the salad bar um is he going to challenge your assertion that this stuff is unhealthy absolutely when uh look and i lived in napa valley we went to a really fine restaurant we paid like 100 bucks for <laughs> just the dinner part of the meal between the two of us and uh i asked the server hey is there anything here that i could buy that hasn't that doesn't have canola in it and she said um mm, uh, actually well you could have a salad without dressing but otherwise no and so um that was kind of the last straw like we thought we had gone to Napa Valley that which calls its hails itself as this culinary epicenter and no we can't still can't get away from the same crummy oil that, that you would get from uh you know any kind of takeout sonic burger whatever um and so we wrote an article called the canola blob because at the time we had a uh recurring column in the Napa Valley register and like two days after it was published, I get this fax from the CIA, which I had to think for a second. I was like, oh wait, they mean the Culinary Institute of America. Oh, yeah. That was the president, right? So the president wants to school me on what I've been saying about canola because I am unnecessarily terrifying people out of eating the most healthy oil, right? So he wants to school me. So I play along and he and I and uh, arranged to have a sit down and, and uh, Luke came with us as well as a reporter for the register just in case the, all hell broke loose. She wanted to be there, I guess. And um, he sat down and, and he, the first thing he did was give us like a, a flight of olive oil tasting with chocolate, right? And he was talking about at a high level chemistry about what they do to keep the olive oil um, like from oxidizing. So like basically going rancid or, or aging in the bottle, right? So they do all this cool stuff where they remove the air and put a level of nitrogen in there and keep it in the dark and all that stuff. And I said to him, I am really actually genuinely impressed with your knowledge. So why are you saying that what applies to olive oil can't possibly apply to canola oil, right? Because canola oil actually has much more fragile 
saturated, I'm sorry, polyunsaturated fatty acids. Those are much more susceptible to oxidation than the fatty acids that are in dominant in olive oil. And he totally understood me immediately. And without skipping a beat, he went from the reality of the science to this political spin. And he said, well, we don't have enough olive oil to feed the masses. I mean, I totally wish I had that recorded because that is like Dr. Evil level of, so let's lie to people because and say that it's healthy because we don't have enough olive oil, which we believe is healthy. And let's say that this other oil that can't possibly be healthy because of the way it oxidizes, let's just say it's healthy. Let's just say it enough. Oh, and by the way, um, they are a corporate sponsor for like all of the CIA's events. Um, and they probably have all kinds of other behind the scenes arrangements about, uh, you know, what's in their kitchen. Uh, so there's conflict of interest. There's, it's cheaper. There's wanting to keep the, the, the really dastardly part that, you know, he wasn't willing to say is I want the good stuff for myself. You know, let's lie to people who don't have the, the knowledge, right, of oxidation and all this stuff and tell them that what they're eating is healthy because it serves me so I can get all the olive oil I want when I want it. I don't have to pay a premium. I mean, look at what happened to the price of avocado oil when people started talking about it as healthy. It used to actually be a cheaper alternative to olive oil, but now I think you'd probably be able to switch gears and make a lot of healthy mayo out of olive oil if you wanted to because there's so such this run on avocados everybody's guzzling them now <laughs> okay so to i guess to to back up a little and cover the spectrum of the oils in a bottle that we use uh to to cook with and that are used in prepared foods um and we have the saturated fats which are uh temperature stable uh, because the the hydrogen uh uh, locations are saturated, right? And that's what keeps them uh, solid at room temperature. And that's also what protects from the oxidative damage when they're heated, such as in cooking. And then we go along this spectrum and maybe you can pick it up and explain why avocado and olive are more healthy and temperature stable than the highly refined seed oils that we see, corn, cottonseed, soybean, canola, and especially highlight canola because uh, if you go on, people have challenged me and say, what do you, what's so bad about this? And uh, I try to give them my, make, make my effort there. And then you can go on the internet and find out that canola uh, is higher in omega-3 and has these many health benefits. And there's a whole, there's a whole section of information uh, that's giving a thumbs up to this. And it seems like once it gets through some gate of uh, conventional wisdom and United States government or the powers that be saying this is okay, then it gets flooded into all 700 locations of Whole Foods Salad Bar and all the, even the finest restaurants, because I can't imagine they care too much about the cost of buying canola versus avocado oil when they're serving a hundred dollar meal. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think people, you know, want to, <laughs> there's a lot of restaurants now that proudly stand that they're serving the healthiest food and they're going local and sustainable and all that. But I think we have a, a knowledge gap here where people still think it's, um, you're making a healthy choice when you choose canola, especially organic canola. Well, you know, I think the there's um, the the tell there and what they really believe is I think they know they're doing it because it's cheaper because when you call restaurants and ask the the staff what oil do you use, unless it's olive oil, they don't have a clue, right? So that means they're not really that proud of it. But they always right, have to go back. Right, and ask. they have to go check. Yeah, the waitress always has to go check when I ask. Right. So they're right. not that proud of it, but, uh, you know, and, and when it's, when it comes back, like, so here's another thing, it comes back as a blend, right? Oh, it's, it's, but they'll say it's olive oil and you, and you'll have to say, do you mean a blend? And they'll be like, oh yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a blended olive oil. Well, a blend could be 1% olive oil and 99% soy. The best blends, the most olive oil you're ever going to get is 30%. So it's still less than half. So why don't they tell you that if they're so proud of it, they think it's so great. Why aren't they telling you? Why don't you, why don't, why do you see this in the grocery store? If canola, if everyone agrees that canola is healthy and everyone even believes it for a second, right? That it's not just all about lies and conflict of interest. Why do they say on um, the front of so many salad dressings, like even Newman's own made with olive oil, but when you turn the back around, there's soy or canola 
first, usually, if not second, usually maybe there's some olive oil, but there's also the others. Why don't they say made with canola on the front when it's really partly olive oil in the back? I mean, that tells you that they don't even believe it themselves. They just want to share in this lie. It's like a talking point, right? Oh, it's healthier because here's what they say. Um, you know, it's healthier than saturated fat, right? Because this, this whole nonsense about saturated fat that nobody who's educated really at this point, I'm sorry, if you still think saturated fat is unhealthy, you cannot call yourself a knowledgeable person in the space of nutrition. Even if you are a dietitian, I mean, I know that's, that's what I learned in medical school. They still teach doctors this, but the fact is it's all nonsense. And you know, so many folks have written books about this at this point, um, most notably besides myself, um, Nina Teicholz and, um, and there's another Dr. Ufi Raffenskopf, all the people who've written about the cholesterol myths. I mean, there's just, so much available now. And if you are interested in nutrition, you haven't come across that, you're going to love it because it's going to finally make sense. Right. I guess we've had an awakening in the last perhaps 40 or 50 years, whereby 50 years ago, uh, it seemed that everyone was pounding this drum that we needed to switch away from these nasty artery clogging fats like butter and um, high fat animal products, uh, eggs, things like that, because they would clog our pipes and give us a heart attack. And um, okay, fine. 50 years ago, that's um, you know, the, the, the most respected people and the most studied people were, were touting that message. And then I guess we've had an awakening that's left behind 99% of the general population that doesn't have time to live and breathe this stuff. And so you're, yeah. you're standing here asserting that anyone who's, who's spent a little time and energy educating themselves is, is going to embrace this new paradigm, which shatters the, the old myths about uh, eating an egg, having that cholesterol run into your bloodstream and, and start clogging up your pipes if you eat too many eggs. Yes, if you haven't heard that, or if you have heard it, but you didn't buy it, I want you to uh, take a look at the history of a man called Ansel Keys, and then I'm gonna plug another documentary <laughs> um, called the, the Real Skinny on Fat. Um, this whole idea, you said the most respected people, but not the most knowledgeable people or the most honorable people, because all of this whole nonsense around saturated fat comes from mostly one man whose name is Ansel Keys, and he actually um, was uh, a big liar pants. Um, I know a lot of folks think who've studied him, actually, they overlook the fact that he did studies that showed that smoking was the cause of heart attacks in all the different countries that he studied. It was clear those countries where they smoked the most, they had the most heart attacks and the people who smoked the most had the most heart attacks. But in, in the interviews that he took back in the fifties and sixties in his day, he downplayed the role of cigarettes in causing heart attacks and said, no, 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 no. I don't think I don't think that's the cause. I think it's the fat in our diet. And specifically, I think it's the animal fat. And now why would he do that? Why? Well, take a look at something called a K ration. This was the, the food that was supplied to the military, the entire military in World War II. So we're not talking about a small time operation. We're talking about a processed food industry coming from nowhere, right? To suddenly now you have ready to eat meals. That is processed food. The K ration. K, guess what that stands for? Keys, Ansel Keys. It's his last name. He is the man who advised the military and was we'll sticking there. And how did he do that? He just went to the grocery store and, and you know said, okay, well, I want some chewing gum in there. I want some cigarettes. I want some chocolate. I want a couple cookies and crackers, some tinned meat and um, some other stuff to just fill people up with. And that was all processed food. So he really should be called the father of processed food. I mean, this man I think is responsible for more deaths than anyone else in history because it's his idea to start telling people that saturated fat is bad. And what that does is that destroys your ability 
to make tasty vegetables, <laughs> right? Because if you can't put just like you know, steam some broccoli and uh, put some melted garlic butter with some salt on there, well, okay, now your kids are going to hate vegetables. So they're going to grow up with this traumatic like feeling of, I, I have to eat my vegetables. I hate vegetables. And they're going to love starchy food and just big piles of starchy foods. And they're going to have starch cravings. And they're going to have all these distorted relationships with foods because they were forced to eat flavorless vegetables. Just, just one example. But this, this one example of the fallout from this idea, but I see this every day. Like my worst diabetics are people who grew up being forced to eat vegetables that didn't have any butter or salt even. Um, they may have had a little tiny bit of margarine, but it just doesn't create this healthy relationship with food because our bodies don't register the fake fats in margarine, which are also very high in polyunsaturates, um, just like vegetable oils. They, it doesn't register that as nutrition because it doesn't, we, it doesn't provide ourselves with the energy that other fats do. So it's not satiating right? It doesn't, so, so it doesn't make you feel like you're full. Um, that's one of the reasons that you can go out to get Chinese food, like, you know, lots of rice, stir fried in some kind of vegetable oil, very little protein. And what protein is in there is lean chicken, usually or lean pork. And you're hungry an hour later. Well, because you didn't have anything that's satiating. You didn't have any cholesterol or saturated fat or monounsaturated fat. These are some of the most satiating things there are. And, you, and we don't get that when we eat. So no wonder we're hungry shortly afterwards. Oh, and that sets us up for trouble and inability to, to burn fat. So I guess if we can um, uh, try to progress toward the, the insights in the book, um, this thing is so fascinating how we've been duped. And so it exists, the, the state today, even health conscious people are uh, getting a certain dose of these nast, nasty industrial seed oils into our bodies, uh, un, unbeknownst a lot of times when we go to the fine restaurant or we don't read the label carefully, uh, they just trickle in there. And then what happens to our fat burning system when we're consuming these, uh, these chemical, chemical agents uh, routinely? So I broke up our metabolism into four fat burning systems. Four. So that's what your metabolism is composed of mitochondria that produce energy, hormones that store and release energy, um, body fat itself, that's like the star of your metabolism show, right? That's where all energy is housed and it's supposed to be your friend and appetite regulation centers in your brain that help you know whether or not you have enough energy or to help you to help decide whether you're hungry and what you're hungry for. And all four of these are dramatically damaged by too much PUFA in the diet. Because what, and the way it happens- You said PUFA, polyunsaturated fatty acid. So that's the, particularly the bottled uh, vegetable oils where we get most of that. Right, what, so we talked about PUFA. saturated- yeah, so we talked about saturated fat being the so-called bad fat and all this. It's, so the opposite of a saturated, stable fat that provides us with, with energy is the polyunsaturated fats that are unstable. And, um, and so, yeah, PUFA, polyunsaturated fatty acid, right? We get all confused about them. The reason that they justified switching uh, us from saturated to these polyunsaturated is because the truth is our bodies do need some. Our bodies need some for building brain and nervous tissue and for signaling within cells, right? So they, they, we need a tiny bit. How much do we really need in our diet? Probably somewhere around 2%, maybe three, maybe mm -hmm. as much as a maximum of five. And it should come from whole foods where these unstable molecules are totally protected the way nature encapsulates them. Naturally, they are protected. They don't break down in a seed, for example, because there's there's antioxidants and all kind of good stuff in there. All right, so nuts and seeds are a reliable source of, a healthy source of PUFA. And then we have to distinguish that. For, instead of just throwing that word around like they're all bad, which we kind of made a mistake early on when we were sorting these stories out, uh, we'd say, stay away from PUFA and go for saturated fats or monounsaturated fats. But you made a great distinction there. So the whole food sources of PUFA 
mainly nuts and seeds. I guess that would be one of the main dietary sources. Okay. Uh, and then we have the chemically altered sources of PUFA, uh, which are the, the, the nasty oils. So yeah, it's, it's, um, it's both a chemical alteration, but the real big problem is the simple amount of them. So, uh -huh. so we're supposed to get somewhere like maybe a minimum of one or 2% to a maximum of 5% in our diet. And, and we know this because we've analyzed what people historically ate and we've, and, and we've run the test and it's like, well, there's, there's only two to maybe a maximum of 5% in the foods that, that used to be in the food supply, the way we used to eat. And even though there was relatively more omega-3 in like grass-fed animals, like uh, grass-fed dairy uh, products, grass-fed beef tallow, um, or pigs that ate like a more foragey type of diet rather than what they get now, which is corn and soy. Um, and chickens and so on and everything. They used to have more about themselves, this balanced ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 because their diet was balanced. But, so, but we've been so myopically focused on, oh yeah, well, we need omega-3 in our diet or we need these essential fatty acids, right? Both omega-3 and omega-6, even though omega-6 tends to promote inflammation and omega-3 tends to kind of fight that, they balance each other. Um, the fact is we only need a certain amount of both. And when we exceed that by five or 10 or even 20 times, we can't be healthy. It's just as simple as that. And what happens is that we, over time, these unstable fatty acids become concentrated in our bodies, specifically in the body fat, right? That's where they get stored, right? When you eat too much of anything, the extra is going to be converted into fat and stored in your body fat. So, but omega-3 and omega-6 are already fat. So it just gets stored as it is. And we can't, we can't take it from being polyunsaturated and turn it into mono unsaturated. We can't do that easily. And so we don't, uh, we just store it as it is. It's, we're not designed to store it to alter it before storage because we never had to do that. We never ate so much that, that it was necessary. And just as just like it's unstable to oxygen in a bottle, it's unstable to oxygen not only in your bloodstream because I mean that's really important. That's a whole other topic, and I talk about that in deep nutrition why it causes heart attacks and strokes. But it's on in, in the fat burn fix. I talk about what it does to your adipose tissue. Adipose tissue is a fancy word for your body fat that's under your skin. The kind of fat that is the normal fat that we have. There's another type of fat. Um, that goes around organs that's that's called omental fat or um it's it's unhealthy fat but so our our body fat our adipose tissue that's under our skin that we see most easily that is now reflective of our diet and i know i've said that 80 percent of our of our fats come from vegetable oils well, when you look down at the level of, so what's the balance of the saturated versus the polyunsaturated, that's somewhere around uh, 20 to 40%, right? Depending on exactly what, who you're looking at, what you're doing, what you're eating. But the average is 10 times higher than what it used to be, right? Like I said, it, it used to be maybe one as a maximum of five. Now it's a minimum of 20. And you know some people get 40 or maybe even 50 of their fat calories coming from this stuff. Um, and percent, I mean, 50%. And so that's directly reflected in their, in their body fat. That means when you do a biopsy of your body fat, it's gonna show 20 to 25% of these PUFAs. It could even be higher, but some of them are like break down so quickly that they, they don't exist. It's, it's like we're, we max out at a certain percentage because they break down so quickly. And when you get to that max out point is where you start getting from um, just being overweight to being deeply diabetic and very high risk for all kinds of problems because your body fat now can't even store more fat. It itself becomes an inflammatory organ and you, and, and you can't put more fat in there easily. It doesn't hold on to fat properly. So it leaks into your bloodstream. It causes heart attacks and strokes. It starts building up in your liver and you get fatty liver. And this, it's all coming from this ridiculous amount of unstable fatty acids in our body fat that came from our diet. When you do biopsies of 
of uh, people's adipose tissue from 100 years ago when their diet had very little, uh, almost no seed oils, so it just had like the natural amount. The content of polyunsaturated fatty acids was like two or three percent. So now when you do biopsies of, of folks, it, you, you find some people where it's low. Of course, there's going to be a range, right, depending on what you eat. But th some people are as high as 30%. That, that didn't happen back 100 years ago. And guess what else didn't happen? Type 2 diabetes. So what I'm saying with the fat burn fix is that the reason we have type 2 diabetes is because we eat too much PUFA. Not too much carb. Uh, wow. So that's sort of a... Um a radical notion because we're familiar with the direct association with eating too many carbs and getting type two diabetes producing too much insulin. Uh, but you made this point clearly to me many times and it's so interesting. So we just want to clarify this really well that um, this is a, a huge contributing factor because when you eat this nasty chemically altered fat, is it the case that you can't burn it really well as you might with another type of healthier fat? Yeah, that's the key. So it's unstable and uh, it, it breaks down in your bloodstream. It breaks down to promote inflammation. But when you, when you try to burn it in the fat burning system that produces energy, so this is the fat burn system number one that I talk about in the fat burn fix. So basically, it's your mitochondria. These are little tiny parts of your cell that generate energy for the cell. And that's where all your calories get burned, by the way. And if your calories are coming from these unstable polyunsaturated fatty acids, in high enough concentration, it just simply shuts down the mitochondria. It blows a fuse. It's too, it burns too hot, right? Like you have to put the right kind of uh, gas in your gas tank or your engine doesn't work right. Well, the exact same is literally true for your mitochondria, for your cells energy, energy engines. Uh-oh, that doesn't sound good. And let me guess then where we're going to get our energy if the power plant's shutting down. We always talk about mitochondria as the, the power plants and how you can liken it to a solar power plant because it's clean burning, because the mitochondria utilize oxygen so you don't have that, that, that uh, free radical production and all these things that, that um, are, are negative and can lead to disease. So if you can't do that well, I'm guessing you're going to have to get your energy from the Slurpee. Exactly. So what happens is there's always sugar in our bloodstream. And, um, you know, unlike there's not always a whole ton of fat in our bloodstream, free fatty acids, um, but there's always sugar. And so if your cells are simply not getting enough energy, there's all these ancient survival mechanisms that kick, kick in and they start slurping <laughs> the slurpee out of your bloodstream as quickly as they can, which drops your blood sugar, right? So the cells start using more sugar drops your blood sugar. How are you going to feel? Like you don't have enough energy, like you don't have enough blood sugar, like you need to snack, like you're hangry, like you're irritable. And so that goes on long enough and your body gets smart in a way and says, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to raise this blood sugar so that what a normal blood sugar, normally fasting is, is somewhere around, uh, when I graduated from school, it was 65 to 85. They've raised it now because everybody's so unhealthy. But um, so 65 to 85 is what I'm sticking with. And so that's normal fasting. And you're kidding. Uh, it's, that's it's so low. I thought um, people are striving to get 100. Right. Because we are so all, all damaged metabolically. We are so, it's like we can't see the forest or the trees. We cannot see what's happening to ourselves because the average person is now metabolically damaged. The average, you know, five year old has uh, much more trouble burning their body fat today than when I was a kid. I mean, it used to be nothing to just play all day and, you know, go, 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 and then come in and you were, you might be rapidly have a fantastic appetite and put, eat whatever's put in front of you if you've been playing all day. Um, but um, the kids these days, they can't do that. They need snacks right after school. They need snacks during school. They need to take snack breaks in school. I mean, this is a huge, we are unable to see what is happening even though it's happening right in front of us. Our children can't burn their body fat, so we have to give them snacks. And instead of saying, hey, what's going on here? We're giving them more sugar, <laughs> right? And they think sugar is the, the solution. Some people think sugar is a solution. Some people think sugar is a problem. Still, we're not seeing the real issue. The underlying issue is this, this only thing that's so radically different than it was 100 years ago. 
Uh, our carb consumption today, our total carb consumption as a percentage of calories is no different than it was 100 years ago. We were already kind of leaning sort of heavily into the carbs 100 years ago, but we did not have type 2 diabetes. It wasn't discovered till 1938, wasn't described. Type 1 was, but type 2 was not until 1938. We had to have enough but the possibility for enough vegetable oil to be concentrated in a few people's tissues where they would develop insulin resistance. And that's, that's the, that's type two diabetes is not about, it's not about eating sugar. You, you have more problems when you eat sugar and now you have a whole other set of problems and you can't really fix it very easily unless you cut your sugar, but you can fix it if you're patient enough, if you you don't even have to cut your sugar if you have willpower, as long as you just get the right kinds of fatty acids into your body. Start eating more healthy fats. You can still eat carbs, and that's what the Fat Burn Fix does. It brings in a huge reality check into this conversation because just the way we've been talking about it has just been one radical swing to another. When I work with for the Lakers, I loved working there. I was working with some of the best people in the industry. Even still, the tendency of the human mind is to, to go from one extreme to the other. So what we were trying to do really was just pull back on the empty calorie carbohydrates and give people more healthy fats like butter and eggs. But what was reported in the news media time and time again was that they were, they were on like a zero carb diet, right? That's not what we were doing. And that's, that's not what anyone really needs to do. Now, if you want to accelerate your metabolic recovery and you are a type 1 or type 2 diabetic and your fasting blood sugar level is higher than normal, you can accelerate it by, by cutting back really deeply on carbs. And that's what the fat burn fix tells you how to do. I mean, uh, the, that's what makes this unique is that we, it, it, it actually gives you a, uh, a diagnosis first before telling you what you need to do to treat your problem. Because there are people all over what I call the diabetes spectrum. And depending where you are, what, what works for a person on one part of the spectrum may not work at all for a person on the other part of the spectrum. This is not your metabolic type. It's, be, it's your metabolic damage. It's the damage to your four fat burning systems. And so um, it, it's not something genetic or that you're born with or based on your blood type or based on whether you're an ectomorph or an endomorph. It's based on how much poof is in your body fat and how that's affected you, all of which can be changed. So first and foremost, uh, total eradication of these refined industrial seed oils from the diet. That's our starting point. Yes. You still need to get you know polyunsaturated fatty acids and you will if you follow a normal healthy food diet, right? Because if you eat nuts and seeds, and even if you have uh, animal fats, especially if it's if you can manage to get like um, grass-fed dairy, that's a great source of omega-3. It's really under-discussed, um, underutilized, uh, but um, you will get plenty of the PUFAs, the ones, the amount that you need. You will get it if you totally cut out all seed oils. Now, what if you look at something and like, let's say we've got like a marinated salmon that's ready to eat. And the, you know, the main ingredient is salmon and there's some spices in there. And like one of the last things is canola or soy oil. Okay, that's probably a drop, all right? It's not gonna kill you. It's about the bulk of your calories. The bulk of your fat calories really should be the natural animal bit products and the natural plant products that are high in fat, like avocado and coconut and nuts um, and uh, whatever animal. I mean, I think that's why the carnivore diet is so popular is because if you're doing carnivore correctly, right, according to the rules, you are not doing seed oils either. So poof, more Quick effectively solution. than anything else. Right. Pretty simple. Elimination diet. Cut, cut this crap out. Yeah, exactly. Uh, can you go into more detail about the four uh, fat burning mechanisms besides the mitochondria? You, you mentioned the hormones, uh, the appetite uh, mechanisms in the brain, and then body fat itself and how those all Correct. interplay to becoming uh, an excellent fat burner. Yeah, so um, the mitochondria are, are like 
the place where you really need to get healthy fats. Like they're the first thing uh, in your whole body that can respond immediately to an infusion, to a switch, to an infusion of good, healthy fats. And once you start building a healthy breakfast and a healthy lunch, you will notice within hours that your mitochondria are functioning better. And you might think, oh, I can't feel my mitochondria. I don't even know what they are. Um, well, you actually, you can. If you feel brain fog when you're hungry, if you feel hangry or irritable, if you get nauseated or headaches or shaky or cold when you're hungry, that's mitochondrial dysfunction somewhere in your nervous system usually, or maybe in your digestive system or both. Um, but uh, when you are getting an infusion of healthy fats, then you're going to make it from one meal to the other without needing a snack. And that's huge. That's huge. Huge. Um, you're, uh, yeah, you're not big on snacking, we, we learned. Right, right. And tell us what happens when you make an innocent reach for something quote unquote healthy, like a, a keto friendly energy bar or even some trail mix or something where you're trying to do the right thing and just uh, take you through uh, the lunchtime hour to the dinnertime hour or breakfast to lunch. How does that set not, you back? Yeah, you're not, you're not burning your body fat. Like you're not um, enabling your, um, your, your stomach hormones and your biological hunger clock to be reset properly. So you're basically in a groove of, you know, you, you know, like if you have a pet, right. Doesn't your dog show up like right around the time you normally feed him. Does, oh, right? Mark Sisson's dog is at five o'clock on the minute every day. It's it's a miracle. His old dog, you, Buddha. Yeah. I mean, do you think he re he knows how to read time? <laughs> do you, did he learn how to read clocks? No. It's because we have an extraordinarily accurate um, circadian clock that tells us when we normally eat. And all it's there for is to help get our digestive system ready to digest food so that we don't have all these weird, you know, digestive symptoms that make people think they have food allergies and all kind of nonsense. It's important to, to, for your body to be ready to accept food. And so ghrelin is, is the main actor here and ghrelin is tied to your circadian clock. And so if you are having even a healthy snack at 10 o'clock, that's like just pure keto, no carbs, um, not, nothing going to mess up your sugar, your insulin. Um, you're still telling your body to make sure to be releasing ghrelin at that point in time, which also blocks fat burn. Ghrelin blocks fat oxidation. It blocks fat release the same kind of way that insulin blocks fat release. Ghrelin blocks it. Slightly different mechanism, but it, the fact is it blocks it. And so ghrelin is the sensation of hunger your famous quote, ghrelin gets your stomach growling. Uh, but if you, if, you, if you don't eat, aren't you going to kick into fat burning? Are you gonna, you're going to um, ignore that sensation of hunger in your stomach and then wait it out? Isn't yes. that a, um, is, is that a reasonable strategy? Or are you saying what happens when, when ghrelin spikes? So if your ghrelin spikes and you are just going to tough it out, like you don't want to snack, um, it'll go away in about five minutes if you drink some water and just get distracted. It's not that, that kind of hunger is not the same as brain fog and feeling hangry and feeling shaky. They are totally different. And, and that's a huge thing that uh, folks... Um, need to be able to distinguish between the two of them. And so in the Fat Burn Fix, I give you worksheets so you can learn what's happening. You can learn whether or not it's a habit-related hunger or just a time of the day related hunger with, due to ghrelin, which is completely a benign thing. You're totally safe to ignore that. Um, but you, it's actually not necessarily safe to ignore your brain fog uh, kind of hunger or your, you know, I'm getting a migraine headache kind of hunger. It's not necessarily safe. And sometimes you can overcome it with a little more adrenaline or a little more cortisol, but hey, guess what? That might lead to this thing we all call adrenal stress or adrenal burnout, right? If there is such a thing, um, it, it, it's, it's 
not going to help that you are constantly needing to boost your blood sugar with adrenaline and cortisol. So um, that that's what is going on when you have some kind of brain fog, or you know you have that more desperate hunger. That it's also doctors call it hypoglycemia symptoms, meaning it's a symptom that your blood sugar is too low because even if your blood sugar level might be normal, but for your body it's considered too low because your body is like, I need more sugar. We've slurped up, up the, um, we, we need massive amounts of sugar over here in this person's body. And unless the blood sugar, fasting blood sugar is 100 or 110, I'm going to feel terrible. So it raises your blood sugar, right? So if you are, say it's 10 o'clock and you want to avoid having a snack, but you're getting brain fog and shaking and stuff like that, the way you're going to get through it isn't just by getting busy. It's going to buy, be by getting revved up, by getting your adrenaline up, because adrenaline and cortisol both help you to raise your blood sugar. And they do help you to burn your body fat a little bit. But it's it's you don't want to have to be digging that deep, right? It's like getting your second win. It's really a strain on these other tissues that they have to produce more adrenaline and more cortisol. It's not you know it's not how it's supposed to be. The way to get out of that cycle is when you make your breakfast, you want to have some healthy fats in there that are what I call the clean burning fats. So you want to have some avocado or butter or um, almond butter. And I teach you how much in the fat burn fix. And you can also have these things that I call slow digesting carbohydrates. And in fact, if you are a diabetic or pre-diabetic, you may not really feel so good on keto, even though keto is a fantastic diet um, for people who are healthy enough for it because you do need some of these slow digesting carbohydrates because otherwise your fasting blood sugar is going to drop and you're just going to be converting protein. I mean, your body's going to be so desperate for sugar. It's going to convert the protein that you just ate into sugar. So you're not going to get your blood sugar down. You, so it, you don't get any benefit from going keto. In fact, it's kind of hurting yourself because you're forcing your bodies to convert amino acids into sugar. And that's not a healthy me metabolic direction either. So that's, that's the key difference between the fat burn fix and every other diet book out there so far is I don't define an arbitrary type, metabolic type based on your, your blood type or your body type. I do it based on how well you burn your body fat. And so there's a quiz in there, it's 15 questions. And it's, you're going to get a score somewhere between zero and a hundred. And if you're over 75, then you're on the super healthy end. And that means, sure, you could just dive right into keto, or you could even do something called intermittent fasting. If you want, you've got a lot of choices, but if you're on the zero to 25 end, we got to slow down. There's a lot to deal with. And I don't want you biting off more than you can chew because that's a setup for failure and and you know you can't change too many habits at once, and you got a lot of habits you're gonna have to change. So I don't tell people that in that scenario to focus on weight loss. I tell them to focus on energy gain. Sure, you're gonna lose some weight, but the focus should be on energy gain until you get healthy enough where you are ready to do these tricks of intermittent fasting. Right. Good point. I mean, you mentioned that cortisol adrenaline response when we're lacking the necessary nutrients, we're not that great at burning fat. And so we kick into this overdrive. And I think all the listeners, viewers could be familiar with those times when, let's say you've been involved in a, a deep personal crisis going on for a sustained six, seven weeks in a row, and you wake up and your fingers are jittery and you're not hungry and you go through the whole day and you haven't eaten anything and you don't even notice because you're just wired on fumes. And of course, that's gonna to lead to, to burnout and, and uh, recalibrations like you see from the, the contestants on the TV show that gained their 100 pounds back that they lost when the camera lights were on. So we wanna be sure to avoid that, that, um, that, that stress element of the dietary transformation. So I guess uh, if we can back up to this idea that the snacking is going to spike ghrelin, are you saying that uh, this is going to happen on a daily basis at 10 a.m. if you start snacking at 10 a.m.? If I feed my mom's little dog, Quincy, a, a scrap or two uh, at 10 a.m. when he's used to eating at 8 a.m. and 5 p.m., then he's going to expect something the next day? Absolutely. That's what happens. We're training just like you. You train your dog to walk better on a leash or to roll over. You're training their appetite and their, you're training their digestive systems 
nervous system to know what time it is. And you do that to yourself too. And so, um, you know, a lot of folks, so, so there's another thing that, um, that I talk about in the body system, um, the most complicated of our four fapron systems are the appetite regulation centers in our brain. So these are, these are the things that, that they do crazy stuff to us. Like they, they make us crave sugar. They make us even, um, not realize when we're snacking. Okay. Now that sounds crazy, but, but like, how could you not realize you're snacking? <laughs> but I've worked with so many folks who swear to me, they didn't have a snack after dinner. They swear to me, they don't snack. Um, and when, not until weeks later, like when we've talked about, okay, well, how come you're not losing weight? This is how it used to be. Now I have a way of fast forwarding this whole conversation and not, or, or until they like do a food diary. Do they realize that, oh my God, I have been snacking like so many times. Like, I didn't realize it. Like I snack all day. I'm a, basically a grazer. I don't even eat real meals. And so this is how people's um, appetite regulation centers totally trick them into thinking that you hardly eat anything, right? Because you do hardly eat real meals. But what doesn't register is the snacking because- what happens, I think the reason this happens is because if you eat something and it makes you feel better, you think you needed it. You think that you were deficient and it, you couldn't possibly be overeating because, for the day, right? Because you got hungry and you, and you felt so bad with your hunger that you were tired. So you had this little snack and it made you feel better. Well, that can't be excess calories. That's something I needed wrong. <laughs> when you have insulin resistance and high insulin, you rapidly convert a lot of what you just ate into body fat, right? So, so that's part of the problem. It doesn't stay in your bloodstream long enough and then you get hungry real quickly. So that's the role, that's the interplay of hormones and your appetite regulation systems, which hide the fact that you're eating when you don't think you're eating. Most people underestimate their calories by at least a third, right? So we're talking 800 to 1,000 calories for the average man and woman, respectively. Um, this was done in the United Kingdom, that they underestimate, right? So no wonder people feel like it's hard to diet because they're already overeating by more than they think. If you're, if you're going to cut down to you know a 1,500 calorie diet, that's going to feel like misery or torture. If you're cutting down, you thought you were eating 2000 calories, you're really eating 3000. And now some dietitian told you, you have to cut down to 1500. That's half of what you were doing. First of all, it's not necessary. You're going to lose weight. If you stop overeating, you're going to lose weight, <laughs> right? If you just pull it back to what you need, which is 2000, you'll feel great. Especially if you build it out of clean burning fats, low digesting carbohydrates, and lots of other nutrition. So it, this is like the fat burn fix just kind of creates a whole new paradigm of reality-based diet rather than paradigm-based diet, right? That's where we've been. We've been fat makes you fat, so don't eat fat. We've been carbs make you fat, so don't eat carbs. These are paradigms. So this is, I guess I could call it reality-based, maybe I'm biased. It's a fat burn based. It's a body fat based paradigm, right? But that, that paradigm makes sense because I think everyone can agree that too much body fat is what makes you fat. And that if you cannot burn your body fat, you are not going to lose your body fat and lose weight. So I think everyone can agree on this particular paradigm. So that's why I call it reality based because I think everyone believe, <laughs> believes in this reality. <laughs> <laughs> is that on the subtitle? I love that. A reality-based diet. You better get it on there. The next printing. You came up with a new one, people. Dr. Kate Shanahan's reality-based diet once and for all. Oh my goodness. So if we can pull out some uh, key attributes, I'm so excited to, you, you sent me an advanced copy. I, I read through it quickly uh, as I've been known to do and are already, um, you know, have talked about a lot of this stuff at length, but I can't wait to get all the way deep into this, but we're pulling out some wonderful insights. One of them is that urgent need to, to cut out the single most offensive uh, agent in the food supply, which is the, the processed oils, and then uh, the no snacking, 
because it, it it spikes ghrelin, which is tied to circadian. And you also mentioned quickly that uh, it's going to shut off fat burning. Even if it's a, a keto approved snack, you're going to stop burning your own body fat in order to to burn whatever you just consumed. Correct. Exactly. And by the way, unless you're burning your body fat, you're not producing ketones. So you can be eating fat all day long and not you'll never make ketones because your oh. liver produces body fat only when you have enough of this other kind of hormone around called glucagon. Uh, I'm sorry, your liver produces ketones. I said produces body fat. I meant your liver produces ketones out of your body fat. Um, and it, it and it only can do that when you have a whole bunch of glucagon hormone. It's like the opposite of insulin is glucagon. And that only happens when you're burning your body fat. And you can maybe force the issue by having a whole ton of coconut fat, but that's not healthy. And I wouldn't recommend that. I mean, that's you can overload your system with anything if you try hard enough. And some folks just go so nuts on eating coconut and MCT, even MCT oil, they just go nuts on it. And um, and it's not healthy at all. You can get yourself fatty liver from just doing that because you shouldn't overload the system with anything. How much is too much if you're a enthusiast of the morning coffee with uh, dumping a bunch of fat calories inside? If you go much above like uh, 500, that's too much, right? And it depends, of course, on your body weight. So someone like me, much above um, 300 calories of fat is going to be too much. Of added fat, like an MCT oil. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Kate, you're destroying the an extremely lucrative movement uh, of, uh, of of the keto scene, where people are been taught to stuff their face with uh, fat and and processed fat snacks and things in order to make ketones. And you're telling us now that um, you can't make ketones by consuming fat. It's uh, you're hard pressed to do it and it's not what you want, right? Like you can only do it by basically overloading your liver. Oh, here's another great way to overload your liver. Drink a lot of alcohol because your body will convert, your body metabolizes alcohol by turning it into acetoacetate. What's that? A ketone. So when, you know, somebody goes out to a party and they have like 12 beers and the next morning they wake up and they are, they are blowing ketones. Was that good for their liver? Was that good for their body? Is that good for their fat burn? No, it's horrible. So the same applies to MCT oil. It's just, you know, if you're overdoing it and you're forcing your, your liver to produce ketones that way, that's not good for you. So don't do it. <laughs> so come into keto from a fasting-based perspective and a, aligned, of course, with a, you know, limiting your dietary carbohydrate intake if you're, if you're an enthusiast of that particular movement. But it sounds like with the fat burn fix, if someone were to walk in the bookstore and grab this off the shelf, uh, like you've described, it kind of transcends any of the factions that we're dealing with right now. It, maybe those are things for people to examine sort of at an advanced level. I try to convey that point too, like this carnivore thing, I do a podcast on it, I feel great, I've done this, I've tried this, but I'm also coming into this with uh, 13 years of highly regimented and focused uh, carbohydrate restriction, fat burning diet. So I'm going to be having a different set of decision making parameters than someone who's struggling, such as the everyday folks that you see. Uh, but if they were to grab the fat burn fix and, and get started, uh, it's pretty much inclusive of anyone with, uh, let's say, their, their belief system is taking them down the plant based path or their, uh, wherever they're coming from, even if they have current metabolic damage, they can succeed with this? Absolutely, yes. And that's the thing. It does transcend the paradigms because it's really focused on the goal of weight loss is burning your body fat, which by the way, is the goal of health. You, there, We keep running into all these studies about like, oh, there's benefits from uh, fasting for three days. Well, oh, well, guess what? After three days, you're burning your body fat. You know, uh, There's benefits from having your insulin levels low. Well, guess what? If you can burn your body fat, that's because your insulin levels are low. I mean, it all comes back to burning your body fat. And it all comes back, the question of why am I not already burning my body fat, which is something no one questions. Everyone assumes, okay, I'm dieting. I am uh, exercising. I am burning my body fat. Not necessarily. If you're losing weight, yes, you are burning your body fat. But is it easy? Is it going to? Is it as easy as it should be? And is it damaging your cells? And so, um, if it's not as easy as it should be, you don't, you can't stay on the diet very long. It feels like torture. 
And the minute you stop, you regain right away. And, and that's what I want to put it into is this yo-yo dieting. That is what I have seen throughout my career. When I see patients who've gone to weight loss specialists, who they lost 60 pounds and they were in love with the doctor because of course the doctor meant well, but he gave them like this, um, this, this packages of like ready to eat powders and, uh, an appetite suppressant. And oh my God, it was the greatest thing. I lost 60 pounds in no time, but then I went uh, on uh, a cruise and I twisted my ankle and oh my God, uh, now I'm just up where I'm even up from where I was. I want to put an end to that yo-yo dieting. This is not that. This is a book for people who want to live in reality, who don't want to live in the fantasy of it's going to be easy to lose 60 pounds by, uh, by the time I need to fit in my bikini. You know, uh, okay, yeah, maybe if you are a super great fat burner, yes, maybe that is reality. But for most people, unfortunately, in my experience, the average person who has 60 pounds to lose is not a good fat burner. And they need to take certain steps to to have success. And if they try to take shortcuts just in the long run, it sets them up to fail and they blame themselves. Like, this is the thing that, that like, I don't want to talk bad about my fellow practitioners because they do mean well, all these weight loss doctors who are like, you got to get people to lose weight fast. So they stay motivated. Okay. I know that's what it looks like that you've heard that, but the fact is telling people that sets them up for, it makes them love you, <laughs> but it makes them hate themselves. And that sets people up for failure because you don't trust yourself. You don't, tr and the most important thing in the fat burn fix is that I want people to trust how they are feeling. You need to trust how you feel. If a diet's not making you feel great, I don't care if you're shedding fat, then it's not what you need. Your body, any diet can make you lose weight, right? You can go on the bubble gum diet for four weeks, have nothing but bubble gum, you're gonna lose weight. Losing weight is easy, but getting healthy and getting to the point where you can burn your body fat, that requires expertise, knowledge, and a belief in the, the fact that nature knows best and an understanding of the four fat burn systems, which the fat burn fix will help you to gain. Very well said, Kate. You are you are an excellent promoter of your own book. I'm. I, I'm <laughs> That's all I got. I don't have supplements. So I, I mean, I, we got I'm, a little into the science and and we we dipped in and out of it. But you you did a good job explaining everything. And I think these these insights are uh, really important. Even if you're an experienced person who's who's listened to a lot of stuff, read a lot of stuff, there's still some notions floating around here that are uh, that are that are kind of been distorted. And now we're we're kind of. Uh, taking our eye off the ball in a sense where you, you bring it all back to burning body fat as, as the end all really. I love that. Yeah, that's really what it is. And that's what everybody wants and, and knows. And when you get that, you will find that you didn't even know yourself. Like if you've never been a really good fat burner, you don't even know what you're capable of. And that's the best part is when people come back and they tell me, I have so much energy now. I started a garden or I, t I bought an, an Instapot, a, a pressure cooker, an immersion blender and a toaster oven. And now I, I'm getting my kids into cooking. I mean, this is who, what you can discover when you really get your metabolism to be healthy and find out who you really are. I, if I, I didn't know how much energy I could have myself. When before I was a fat burner, I was still like stuck in being a sugar burner mode when, back when I was an athlete. This was like 20 years ago. But, um, you know, I, I didn't know. I thought I was just somebody who at the end of my work day, I was kind of grumpy, you know, and I was like, I just, I must just be a grumpy kind of tired ish person. But no, that's not, that wasn't me. And it's, if you feel that way after work, that's not you. And just know that. Love it. The fat burn fix. <laughs> available everywhere books are sold. And if we want to get deeper in, we can go check you out at uh, drkate.com. You have some good content there. I do, drkate.com. And also, if, uh, if you just want to remember one thing, remember fatburnfix.com, because that's the new mini website for the book, and it connects to Dr. Kate anyway, um, and also tells you, uh, you know, where you can get the book and all that kind of cool stuff. You can even listen to an audio snippet, and you can download 
and take the test to find out your fat burn factor today. Oh, oh well, fun. It's released. <laughs> All right. Fatburnfix.com. Thank you so much. Dr. Kate Shanahan, great show. Go check it out, people. Thanks, Brad. Dum, 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 dum. All right. Wow.